In this particular video, we're going to be looking at uh, the very first section, which is called Mathematics and Problem Solving. What we'll be looking at is two things, the four-step problem solving process and strategies for problem solving. Okay, George Polya is a uh, mathematician, and he created a uh, four-step procedure for uh, solving problems. The first step is to understand the problem. Number two is devising a plan. Number three, carrying out the plan. And number four, looking back. We'll first talk about the first uh, procedure in this problem solving process. One is to understand the problem. And here's some uh, strategies that you can use for this particular uh, process or this first step. Number one is to state the problem in your own words. Also, you can identify what you are trying to find or do. Then un identify the unknowns. Determine what information is given in the problem. Determine what information, if any, is missing or not needed. Okay, so here you want to first read the problem. Usually, you're going to have word problems when you're dealing with mathematics and you want to use this procedure, use this four-step process to uh, solve problems. So here, these are just some strategies that you can use in understanding the problem. Then step number two, you want to devise a plan. And what do we mean by devising a plan? You want to look for a pattern. You want to examine a related problem or examine a simpler or special case of that problem, then make a table or a list, identify a sub-goal, or make a diagram. Sometimes when you devise some plan, usually with uh, some problems you may have to draw your draw a picture to uh, get a uh, visual idea of what that problem is asking for you to do and what you want to look for. Then the, you can also use guess and check then work backward, and then write an equation. Now, step number three is carrying out the plan. And some strategies for carrying out the plan would include implement the strategy and perform any necessary actions or computations, attend to precision in language and mathematics used. Sometimes the wording in that particular problem may ask you to uh, just write it using mathematical terms. Then check each step as you proceed. Keep an accurate record of your work. Okay. So you want to check each step. That's very important because if you kind of make a mistake, you want to go back and try to correct that as quickly as you can. Then the final step is to look back. You want to check the results in the, using the original problem. And when you're using the original problem, you want to use the original wording of the problem. Because you want to interpret the results in the terms of that original problem. And you want to ask yourself, does that answer make sense? And is it a reasonable answer? Then you want to determine if there is another method to find, the, find that solution. Because... Some cases, there are more than one ways to solve, prob solve a particular problem. And if possible, determine other related or more general problems for which these strategies would work. Okay. Now, the strategies are just tools that might be used to discover or construct the means to achieve a goal. And because problems may be solved in more than one way, there is no one best strategy to use. And sometimes strategies can be combined in order to solve a problem. Okay. Like in this particular situation here. One strategy is just looking for a pattern. Let's take this example. When Carl Gauss, who's a mathematician, was a child, his teacher required the students to find the sum of the first 100 natural numbers. The teacher expected this problem to keep the class occupied for some time. But for Gauss, he gave the answer almost immediately. 
and how did he solve that problem? Okay, so this is one of those particular situations where there is a strategy for looking for a pattern. All right, now here we're going through uh, Polya's four step process of solving problems. Here we first understand the problem. In this case, the natural numbers are 1, 2, 3, 4, and so on. The problem here is to find the sum of 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4 and so on up to plus 100. So we're finding the sum of the first 100 numbers. And here we devise a plan. So here we list the numbers as shown. Here we're going to let S be this sum, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, and so on up to plus 100. Then, here's what we got here. We got the S equals to this pattern right here, and then another S is going to be listing the 100 numbers in descending order, starting with 100, 99, 98, 97, 96, all the way down to plus 3, plus 2, plus 1. This first one starts from 1 up to 100. The second one starts from 100 down to 1. Now we're going to add these two together. Here, S plus another S, that's 2S. And then we're going to add each of these columns one by one. 1 plus 100 is 101. 2 plus 99 is 101. 3 plus 98 is 101. And so on. So as you can see, the sum of these numbers add up to 101. Now you want to divide that sum by by 2. The sum, which is 2s, you want to divide that by 2. And as you can see with that sequence, there are 100 sums of 101. So if you multiply 100 times 101, that's equal to 2s, and then take 100 times 101, which is, I believe, 10,100, divide that by 2, you'll get 5,050. So in this case, the sum of the first 100 numbers would be 5,050. And then you want to look back. <coughs> Here, the method is mathematically correct because the addition can be performed in any order, and multiplication is considered to be repeated addition. Now, later on, we're going to be talking about um, multiplication in one of the chapters in your text that deals with, uh, you know, patterns of multiplication, which is considered to be repeated addition. The sum in each pair is always 101 because when we move from any pair to the next, we add 1 to the top and subtract 1 from the bottom, which does not change the sum. So 2 plus 99, that's the same as 1 plus 1 plus 100 minus 1, and that's equal to 1 plus 100. 3 plus 98 is the same as 2 plus 1, plus 99 minus 1, and that's equal to 2 plus 99 equals to 101, and so on. Here we want to examine a related problem, which is another strategy. In this example, we want to find the sum of the even numbers less than or equal to 100. Devise a strategy for finding that sum and generalize the result. Okay, now let's take a look at this one. We're going to go through that four-step process. Here we understand the problem. Even real numbers are 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, and so on. The problem here, we want to find the sum of the even natural numbers. That's 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus, and so on, up to plus 100. Next, we're going to devise a plan. That's step number two. Here, we're going to recognize that the sum can be separated into two simpler parts related to Gauss's original problem, and that helps us devise a plan. So, in this case here, we can say 2 plus 4 plus 6 plus 8 plus, and so on, up to 100. That's saying... 2 times 1, plus 2 times 2, plus 2 times 3, plus 2 times 4, and so on, up to 2 times 50. And in this case here, the common 
factor or the common multiple in that set is two. So the two comes on the outside, and then you have this sum from one to 50. One plus two plus three plus four, all the way up to plus 50. And then we carry out the plan. In this case here, there are 50 sums of 51. So we do 50 times 51, divide that by 2. But notice we got this 2 on the outside, so whatever this is, this is going to be multiplied by 2. And you'll get the final answer, 2,550. So the sum of the first 100 even numbers will be 2,550. And then we look back. And here's a different way to approach the problem is to realize that there are 25 sums of 102. And as you can see here, 2 times, I mean 2 plus 100, that's 102. 4 plus 98 is also 102. 6 plus 96 is 102. 8 plus 96, 94 is 102. And this continues all the way to 50 plus 52, which gives you 102. So there are 25 sums of 102. Examining a simpler case is another strategy. One strategy for solving a complex problem is to examine a simpler case of the problem and then consider other parts of the complex problem. Another strategy would be making a table. An often used strategy in elementary school mathematics is making a table. A table can be used to look for patterns that emerge in the problem, which in turn can lead to a solution. Okay. Now here's an example of identifying a sub-goal, which is another strategy. Arrange the numbers 1 through 9 into a square, subdivided into 9 smaller squares like the ones shown in the figure, so that the sum of every row, column, and main diagonal is the same. Okay? So we got nine numbers from one through nine, and we want to put those numbers into this square, into each of the individual squares in a certain way so that each row, each column, and the main diagonal have the same sum. First step is to understand the problem. We need to put each of the nine numbers from one through nine into in the small squares. A different number in each square so that the sum of the numbers in each row, in each column, and in each of the two major diagonals are the same. Next, we'll devise a plan. If we knew the fixed sum of the numbers in each row, column, and diagonal, we would have a better idea of which numbers can appear together in a single row, column, or diagonal. Our sub-goal here is to find that fixed sum. So here the sum of the nine numbers from one through nine will equal three times the sum in one row. So that fixed sum, fixed sum, Add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, you're going to get 45. Divide that by 3, you're going to get 15. So that fixed sum would be 15. Okay, so now, more of devising a plan. We need to decide which what numbers could occupy the various squares. The number in the center square will appear in four sums, each adding to 15. Two diagonals, the second row and the second column. Each number in the corners will appear in three sums of 15, as you'll see. Now, if we write 15 as the sum of three different numbers, one through nine, in all possible ways, we could then count how many sums contain each of the numbers, one through nine. The number that appears in at least four sums are candidates for placement in the center square, whereas the numbers that appear in at least Three sums are candidates for the corner squares. Okay. So here, the sum of 15 can be written like this. 9 plus 5 plus 1. 9 plus 4 plus 2. 
8 plus 6 plus 1, 8 plus 5 plus 2, 8 plus 4 plus 3, 7 plus 6 plus 2, 7 plus 5 plus 3, 6 plus 5 plus 4. Now, notice that 5 appears in 4 of these sums. So the only number that appears in 4 sums is 5. So 5 must be the number that will be in the center square. Okay. And because 2, 4, 6, and 8 appear three times in each, they must go in the corners. Okay. So if we choose 2 for the upper corner, then 8 must be the number in the lower right corner. Okay. Because we're letting the center square be 5. Now we could place 6 in the lower left hand, lower left corner or in the upper right hand corner as you see here and then complete that magic square. But if we put the 6 here then that means the 4 has to go in the lower left hand corner. Now we see that we have seen that 5 was the only number among the given numbers that could appear in the center. However, we have various choices for the corner, and so it seems that the magic square we found is not the only one possible. Okay. And may I go back to that magic square here? As you can see here, if we put the 4 there, then 2 plus 4 is 6, and that sum has to be 15, so the 9 would go here. And 2 plus 6 is 8, so 7 must go here to get a sum of 15. And then 6 plus 8, that's 14. And then the 1 has to go there to give you the 15. And then 4 plus 3 plus 4 plus 8 is 12 plus the 3 will give you the 15. Okay, so here, that square will be complete. Okay, now I'm making a diagram. It's another strategy. Sometimes drawing a picture would be the best way to uh, solve word problems so that way you can get a visual idea of what that problem is asking you to do. Bill and Jim ran a 50 meter race three times. The speed of the, num of the runners does not vary in the first race. Jim was at the 45 meter mark when Bill crossed the finish line. And here's two parts. In the second race, to make the race closer, Jim started five meters ahead of Bill, who lined up at the starting line, who will win the race. And in part B, in the third race, Jim started at the starting line, and Bill starts five meters behind, who will win the race. Okay. We first understand the problem. When Bill and Jim run a 50 meter race, Bill wins by five meters. That is, when Bill covers 50 meters at the same time, whenever Bill covers 50 meters at the same time, Jim covers only 45 meters. If Bill starts at the, at the starting line and Jim is given a five meter head start, we are to determine who will win the race. If Jim starts at the starting line and Bill starts five meters behind, we are to determine who will win. And in this case here, you can see the visual representation here that Bill has finished. He's ran 50 minutes and he's finished while Jim has ran 45 meters. So he's five meters away from the finish line. And in race number two, you can see that Bill started five meters behind. Okay. And in this case, race number three, you can see that uh, Jim had a five meter head start than Bill. So here at 45 meters, they will be tied.
Now from those diagrams, we can determine the results in each case. In race number one, Bill will win by five meters. In race number two, they reach the finish line at the same time. And race three, since Bill is faster than Jim, Bill will cover the last five meters faster than Jim and will win the race. And the look back will be the diagram shows the solution makes sense and it is appropriate. So you want to make sure that the doc, that uh, when you look back, you want to make sure that the answer does make sense. And guess and check is another strategy. First guess at a solution using as reasonable a guess as possible. Then check to see whether the guess is correct. The next step is to learn as much as possible about the solution based on the guess before making the next guess. This strategy is often used when a student does not have the tools to solve the problem in a faster way and is used primarily by students in grades 1 through 3. And then working backwards. In some problems it's much easier to start with the result and then try to work backwards. Like in this case, it took five, it took workers five weeks to dig a 10-mile tunnel. During the fourth week, the workers dug two and a half miles. The next week, they dug one and one-fourth miles to complete the tunnel. How much had the workers completed after the first three weeks of digging? The workers completed a 10-mile tunnel in five weeks. During week four, they dug two and a half miles. And during week five, they dug one and one-fourth miles. So we need to find out how many miles of tunnel they dug in the first three weeks. That's understanding the problem, which is always step number one. Then step two, we devise a plan. We know how many miles they dug in the last two weeks, so we'll work backwards using the strategy here. In weeks four and five, they dug two and a half plus one and a fourth, or three and three quarters miles. So we add two and a half and one and one, one and one fourth together to get a fraction of three and three fourths miles. So in weeks one through three, they dug ten minus three and three fourths. Subtract that, you get six and one fourth miles because they did dig a uh, ten mile tunnel in five weeks. And then you want to look back, add those uh, numbers together, six and one-fourth, which was the first three weeks, two and a half for the fourth week, and one and one-fourth for the fifth week will give you a total of 10 miles. So that answer does make sense. So it's good to check by doing, by working backwards. Okay, now this will conclude this video on just uh, the uh, problem-solving process and some of the strategies that uh, can be used to solve problems.